Hi, this is our second video on probabilities. It covers most of section 5.3 with a review at the end of everything we've covered through the first three sections. We're going to start here with some definitions. First, independent events do not affect the probability of each other. However, two events are dependent if the occurrence of one affects the probability of the other. And so what we're going to be looking at here in section 5.3 and then again in section 5.4 is these, this idea of independent and dependent events. So if you're trying to figure out if two events are independent or dependent, a good question to ask is whether they can happen in either order. If the order that these events happen in makes a difference with the probabilities, that means they are dependent. They must depend on each other. Now, a big thing to make a note of here, the idea of events being independent and disjoint are completely separate. Whether an event is independent has, ne has nothing to do with whether an event is disjoint. So let's just take a look at uh, some quick examples about independence or dependence to make sure our intuition is correct. So we're looking at two events in each one of these cases. So number one, robbing a bank and going to jail. Are those independent or dependent? Well, the chances of you going to jail are definitely going to change if you've robbed a bank, right? They're probably going to increase. So these would definitely be dependent, right? The first one is definitely dependent because robbing a bank, you are more likely go to, to go to jail. Number two, flipping a coin twice. Well, you flip the coin and then you flip it again. Well, did the coin remember what was going on? No. So this is definitely going to be independent. All right. Anytime you flip a coin, each flip is independent. What about drawing two cards from a standard deck of cards? Now, number three and four kind of go together. So number four says you draw the card from a deck of cards, you put it back, and then you draw another card. Well, if you're putting it back, then that is definitely going to be independent. You're drawing a card from the same sample, from the same set. However, if you draw two cards from a standard deck of cards, this is actually going to be dependent and we're going to look at this more with some examples in the next video but when you start with a deck of cards there's 52 cards when you pull one out now your deck only has 51 cards left you've changed your sample space which means your next draw is dependent all right it means it's not going to be independent anymore they are definitely dependent number five rolling a six-sided die and flipping a coin well the die can't remember, the coin can't remember. These are both independent events and together they're still independent. Let's take a look at another five. What about purchasing a car, then purchasing a gallon of milk? Well, are they related to each other? Does that change your probability? Well, I, I, I don't really think so. I think whether you have a car or not, the probability of you drinking milk isn't really going to change. However, what if you're purchasing a car, then purchasing a gallon of gas? Well, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you don't have a car, you're probably going to be less likely to buy a gallon of gas. So those would definitely be dependent. What about not attending class, then failing an exam? Well, yeah, that's pretty obvious that it's going to be dependent. You're going to be much more likely to fail if you didn't attend class. Similarly, what about number four, going to the movies early and getting a good seat? Well, this one's kind of ambiguous because in some movie theaters, that is true because, well, you can get the seat you want if you show up first and the theater's empty. However, well, a lot of theaters have you pre-purchase tickets with assigned seating. So does it matter if you get there early? Not necessarily. So we actually have not enough information to answer number four. Number five, what about winning the lottery and running out of milk? Well, again, they seem like they're not that related. Even if you win the lottery, you could still run out of milk. But if you won the lottery and then you hired a housekeeper whose job it was to keep milk in the house, then, well, you're probably less likely to run out. So again, sometimes there's just not enough information. And, well, we leave that one kind of as a question mark. And it would be something that, we could then use experiments and more of the empirical method to actually record data 
and do a study and see if there's a relationship between winning the lottery and running out of milk. Because, well, I don't know if we have enough information to answer that quite yet. However, for the rest of this video, we're going to focus on just independent events. Again, the, the next section 5.4 deals with dependent events and what's called conditional probability, which we'll spend much more time with. But for now, we're just going to stick with our independent events. And if two events are independent, then the probability of both occurring, so the probability of E and F is the probability of E times the probability of F. And again, remember, and is that intersection or that overlap where it has to be both events. All right, so let's take a look at example seven. What is the probability of flipping a coin three times and getting all heads? Well, the coin can't remember each flip, which means each flip is independent. So what we really wanna do here is find the probability for just one flip and then use that multiplication rule to figure out, well, what is the probability of getting all heads on three flips? Now, for one flip, again, we know my sample size is two. It's either got to be a heads or a tails. We know that the event is just one. We know that, again, we want just the heads. And so the probability is one half. Fairly straightforward. Now that I want the probability of getting three heads in a row, well, the probability of getting three heads is the probability of rolling heads the first time the probability of rolling heads a second time, and the probability of flipping the heads the third time. And again, since they're all independent and the coin can't remember, it's just a matter of, well, multiplying. So it'll be one half times one half times one half. Now, anytime we're multiplying the same number by itself several times, we want to use exponents. And we're gonna make use of exponents quite a bit because they are gonna make life, well, quite a bit easier here. So if we're multiplying the same thing three times, that's the same as raising it to the third power. So one half to the third power is one eighth, or if we're doing a probability as a decimal, 0.125. So now expected value. To find how many times we expect an event to occur, we multiply the probability of that event times the number of times we run the probability experiment. And yeah, probability experiment is probably a much fancier word than we necessarily need in most situations because we could just say it's flipping a coin instead of calling it a probability experiment. But again, any event where there is probability involved and, and the outcome is not certain, we call a probability event. But like I said, it's fairly straightforward. Expected value is always n, the number of times you do something, times p, the probability. So we have 25 people in class. So if everyone at home flipped a coin three times, how many people would we expect to flip three heads in a row? Well, again, n is 25, that's my sample size. P is 0.125, that probability we just calculated. So the expected value is we multiply those two, we get 3.125. Now again, in context, we wouldn't expect 3.125 people to flip three heads in a row because you can't have a point of a person so we had to round to whatever is reasonable. So we would expect three people to flip three heads in a row. Yeah, not everybody would do it. And you might feel kind of special if you did though. So let's take a look at another similar example. So example eight, what's the probability of rolling a six-sided die five times and getting a one every single time? So you rolled your dice and every single time it came up as a one, right? Five ones in a row, Yahtzee. Well, each roll is independent. So again, we can find the probability of rolling a one just once and then use our exponents to find that probability of getting five in a row. So our sample size is six, right? There's six sides to a die. We only want one of those sides, which is the number one. So that's one. So the probability of rolling a one is one out of six. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward and makes sense. Now, doing the multiplication rule, the probability that all five are a one, maybe the probability that the first is a one, the probability that the second roll is a one, the third is a one, the fourth, and the fifth. They're all independent, so we just multiply them. Well, we know each one independently is one sixth, so it's one sixth times one sixth times one sixth times one sixth times one sixth, or again, it's much, much easier to use our exponents. One sixth to the fifth power. 
Now, my decimal approximation comes out as this. If I type this into the calculator, this is what my calculator tells me the answer is 1.2860823E negative 4. This is not what you should type into my math lab. You need to be very, very careful. Every time you do a probability, remember, it needs to be between 0 and 1. This is clearly, well, it looks like it's bigger than 1, and the reason is this E right here. E means scientific notation. E is the calculator shorthand for that times 10 to the whatever power. All right, which in this case is negative 4. So this is scientific notation. If you want to answer this question, you have to convert it back to a decimal which means in this case, we need to move that decimal place four spots because that's my number here at the end. So moving over four spots, one, two, three, four. Well, my answer becomes 0 0.0001286. So that is fairly unlikely. That is a very small probability. It would be very unusual for you to roll a die five times in a row and get all ones. However, Let's talk about expected value. If I asked everybody in the entire state of Connecticut to roll a die five times, how many of those people would we expect to actually roll five ones in a row? Well, there's 3.6 million people in Connecticut, so now our N is, well, 3,600,000. The probability we just found a second ago, and so my expected value is just multiplying these two. And when I multiply the 3.6 million times the probability of rolling all ones, I get 462.96. Well, we round that up. I would expect 463 people in the state to roll a one five times in a row, which again is a very unlikely thing. But as we start increasing right, the, the number of probability experiments, well, we would expect these events to occur. And essentially this, this, this very core concept to probability if you watch the news tonight and you find out on the news that somebody won the lottery, you're probably not going to be surprised, right? It's not surprising that someone wins the lottery. However, if you won the lottery, you would be surprised because, well, you're just that one case out of the whole group. So try to keep that in mind. It's not surprising that someone wins the lottery. However, it is surprising if you win the lottery. And that is this whole idea of sample sizes and expected values. Now, on to what is typically the most confusing part of these first three sections, talking about these at least probabilities. Now, anytime we see an at least probability, we typically want to immediately invoke the complement rule. All right, so remember, the complement rule is when we have two disjoint uh, occurrences, and we know that the sum of the disjoint occurrences has to add up to one. So the probability that something happens at least once and the probability that something never happens, well, those are the only two possibilities, right? It either happened or it never happened. Those are your only two possible outcomes. So when you add them together, they have to equal one and there's no overlap. And again, the probability that something happens and the probability that something doesn't happen. Those are the complements all right, there's no overlap and it has to add to one. So hopefully that part makes sense. Now, typically we invoke this with that complement rule, which we know is written slightly differently, that the probability of something happening at least once is really one minus the probability that it doesn't happen. Again, it's the same idea, right? These two equations are completely equivalent. They both say the same thing. Uh, it's just that the second one is typically the one that we use more in practice. but I'm going to admit that even as a professor, I always, always set this first one up in the beginning because it makes it much easier for me to understand what's going on as we do the problem. So let's go back to that example of the birth control pill from that previous video. We know that the birth control pill is 98% effective for any given month, which means in a given month, it would fail 2% of the time. Well, what is the likelihood that the birth control pill is going to fail at least once during a five year span? Again, I see that phrase at least, right? At least once, which means set up the complement rule. And in this case, I want to know that it fails at least once. So at least one failure. Well, what's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite of one failure is that it 
works every single time. Those are your only two options. It either fails at least once or it works every time. Those are the only two possible outcomes. Those are definitely going to be your complements, which when I add them together, they equal one. And then setting it up as my complement rule, which again is the second part, I know that the probability that it fails at least once is going to be one minus the probability that it works every time. Now I have to worry about actually, well, figuring out that probability that it works every single time. Well, each month is independent. Now, obviously if the birth control pill fails and you're actually pregnant, then the experiment's kind of over. But typically each month is going to be independent. Uh, it is not going to matter whether it worked or it failed on month three to determine whether or not it's going to work or fail on month four. Right? These are all independent. Now, if we're talking about a five year span, which is really 60 months, right? 12 times five. So the probability that it works for all 60 months is gonna be the probability that it works in any one given month. And then we make my exponent 60. So we know it works 98% of the time, which is really 0.98. We raise that to the 60th power. And this is the answer that my calculator gives me. So the probability it works all 60 months is 0.297553. Now we bring that back to our complement rule. So the probability of at least one failure is going to be one minus the probability it works all 60 months. Just plug in our numbers. And so the probability of at least one failure is 0 0.70247, which means over a five year span, there is a 70.24% chance that the birth control pill fails at least once. And again, this kind of goes back to that idea that it's not unusual that someone wins the lottery, but it's unusual if you win the lottery. Well, same idea here. It would be very unusual if the birth control pill fails in any one given month. But when you start looking at a longer span of time, well, that failure is going to creep in. And it happens all the time in a bunch of different scenarios, not just the birth control pill, which I use this example because when I learned statistics almost 20 years ago in college myself, this example stuck out in my head. But it also occurs with, well, building bridges. Things are going to fail every once in a while. It's just a part of our society that we've engineered things and we create new things. Things are going to fail and we have to kind of be okay with that. We need to accept that failure and mistakes are an embedded part of our society. All right, the last thing I wanna do in this video is kind of sum up in this example and go through everything we've talked about in these three sections. So let's take a look at example 10, which we're gonna do five different parts of. So the probability that a person in the United States has blue eyes is about 0.17 or 17%. So about 17% of the population has blue eyes in this country. Now, the probability that someone in, this U, in the US has type two diabetes is about 0.12 or about 12%. So about 12% of the population has type two diabetes. Now, if a person is chosen at random, what is the probability that he has blue eyes and he has type two diabetes? All right, the key here, that word and. Anytime you see the word and, you want to think the multiplication rule. So the probability that you have blue eyes and type 2 diabetes is the probability that you have blue eyes times the probability that you have type 2 diabetes. We know both of those values. We just multiply them together using our calculator. So the probability that you have both is that 0 0.0204 number there. Again, the key here, you see and, you should think multiplication. Part B. If a person is chosen at random, what is the probability he has blue eyes or he has type 2 diabetes? So again, in English, there's not always that big of a distinction made between the words and and or. However, in probability, there is a big distinction because or should always make you think of using the addition rule. All right, we want the addition rule. So the addition rule, if you have blue eyes or type 2 diabetes, remember that's where you're gonna add the probability of the blue eyes plus the probability that you have type two, but you don't want to double count. So you need to subtract the overlap. 
right? You need to subtract those people that have blue eyes and type 2 diabetes because you counted them with the blue eyes, you counted them with the type 2, we can't count them twice. But now again, we just plug in our probabilities. We know the probability for blue eyes was 0.17, the probability of type 2 diabetes was 0.12, and we just found that overlap in the very last question, so we use that value from the last question. Yeah, type it into the calculator. The probability that someone has blue eyes or type 2 diabetes ends up being 0 0.2696. Part C. If a person is chosen at random, what's the probability that he does not have blue eyes? Well, anytime you see the word not, you want to think the complement rule. And so the probability that you don't have blue eyes is going to be 1 minus the probability that you do have blue eyes. So 1 minus 0.17. The probability that you don't have blue eyes is 0.83 or 83%. Again, if 70% of the people have blue eyes, then yeah, 83% of the population is not going to have blue eyes. Part D, if five people are chosen at random, find the probability that all five have blue eyes. So the key here is all. If you see the word all, typically you wanna use exponents to make your life easier. So the probability that all five people have blue eyes is the probability that you have blue eyes raised to the fifth power. Again, it's that exponent right there. Well, again, just plug it all into your calculator point. 1, 7 to the fifth power ends up spitting out this answer. Now again, be careful. We see that E, right? That means it's scientific notation. That means you need to write that out on your paper and move that decimal place over the appropriate number of spots. In this case, four spots. And we get that the answer is 0 0.00014. Lastly, if five people are chosen at random, find the probability that at least one does not have blue eyes. Again, at least, if you see that phrase at least, we want to think the complement rule. So again, let's build our complement rule from the ground up. So at least one doesn't have blue eyes or everyone has blue eyes, right? Those are the only two possibilities. Everybody has blue eyes or at least one person doesn't have blue eyes. So we can set those up as our complements because those are the only two possibilities. We want to solve for the, you know, the at least one does not, so subtract. And again, we just use the numbers really from our last answer. The probability that one does not is going to be one minus the probability that all five do. And again, just put it in your calculator and we end up with the answer 0.99986. All right, let's hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, again, don't forget to email me. And good luck.